we are all evil in some form or another. Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. The Night Stalker, said in an interview after being imprisoned for his terrifying crimes. You may be wondering who this guy is. Richard Ramirez was one of the most vicious serial killers in American history. In the middle of the 80s, The Night Stalker was more than a man. He was a nightmare. The citizens of Los Angeles were terrorized by a serial of brutal sexual assaults and murders. People didn't know if they were gonna live to see the next morning. A one-man epidemic of madness and murder, the American media said about him. Men, women, boys and girls saw this face of evil. But what drove him to do these things? Richard was born the youngest of five children on February 29, 1960 in Texas. His father was an army veteran and he had a really violent temper. He was prone to bursts of anger and he would often physically abuse his wife and his children. Richard spent most of his early days with his babysitter or playing in the yard by himself. When he was around two years old, he was reaching for a radio when a dresser fell on his head, leaving him with 30 stitches and a concussion. After three years, he had another accident at a playground when a swing knocked him unconscious. He was rushed to the hospital and sent home with more stitches. After that accident, Richard was starting to experience seizures and was diagnosed with epilepsy. Side note, if any of you have been paying attention to all the serial killer's backstories, usually, the murderer was a victim of some kind of abuse at a young age or had a head injury. Experts say this could be the reason he had disturbing visions and vivid dreams. Now, back to the backstory. So, because Richard's household was really toxic, he would spend a lot of time with his cousin. His cousin's name was Miguel. He was much older than Richard and he had been an army veteran who served in the Vietnam War. Miguel would tell and show pictures of awful and violent sexual assaults to Richard that he committed. He even had photos of him posing with a severed head belonging to women that he assaulted and murdered. He also taught Richard what he learned as a soldier, stealth, precision, and combat. He wanted him to know how to fight and murder. One day, Miguel murdered his wife in front of Richard and he said that that's when he became obsessed with murderers, crimes, and death. And that's when his awful murders and crimes of the Night Stalker are starting to appear. By the time he was 15, Richard landed a job at the Holiday Inn. A friend gave him a master key to the rooms. He would watch people through the openings in their curtains, then slip inside once they were asleep to steal valuables. But one night, he wanted more. He hid in the closet while a guest was in the bathroom, then tried to sexually assault her. Her husband walked in and caught him off. Richard was arrested, but the charges were dropped when the couple refused to come back and testify. After that, he moved to California for good where his darkness would be consummated in the act of various depravities including sexual assault, extreme violence, and murder. Here is a list of some of his most disturbing murders. On April 10, 1984, Ramirez committed his first murder. He murdered Mei Liung, a 9-year-old Chinese girl in the basement of his apartment building in the Tenderloin district of San Francisco. Yung was with her 8-year-old brother and reportedly looking for a lost $1 bill when Ramirez approached the girl and told her to follow him into the basement to find it. Once they were in the basement, Ramirez beat, strangled, and sexually assaulted Yung before stabbing her to death with a switchblade, hanging her partially nude body from a pipe by her blouse. The murder was not linked to Ramirez until 2009 when his DNA was matched to a sample obtained at the crime scene. On March 17, 1985, Ramirez attacked 22-year-old Maria Hernandez outside her home in Rosemead, California, shooting her in the face with a 22 caliber handgun after she pulled into her garage. 
she survived when the bullet ricocheted off the keys she held in her hands as she lifted them to protect herself. Hernandez played dead until Ramirez left the scene. Inside the house, her roommate, Dale Yoshi Okazaki, age 34, heard the gunshot and ducked behind a counter when she saw Ramirez enter the kitchen. When she raised her head to get a look at what had happened, he shot Okazaki once in the forehead, killing her instantly. On the night of July 2, 1985, he drove a stolen car to Arcadia and randomly selected the house of Mary Louise Cannon, age 75, a widowed grandmother. After quietly entering Cannon's home, he found her asleep in her bedroom. He bludgeoned her into unconsciousness with a lamp and then stabbed her to death using a 10-inch butcher knife from her kitchen. Ramirez repeatedly stabbed Cannon's body after she was already dead. She was found dead at the scene. On March 27, 1985, Ramirez entered a home that he had burglarized a year earlier just outside of Whittier, California at approximately 2 a.m. and killed the sleeping Vincent Charles Zazara with a gunshot to his head from a 22 caliber handgun. Zazara's wife, Maxine Lavinia Zazara, was awakened by the gunshot and Ramirez beat her and bound her hands while demanding to know where her valuables were. While he ransacked the room, Maxine escaped her bonds and retrieved a shotgun from under the bed, which was not loaded. The infuriated Ramirez shot her three times with a 22, then fetched a large carving knife from the kitchen. He mutilated her body by stabbing her several times, then removed her eyes with a knife and placed them in a jewelry box which he took when he left and kept at his apartment as a souvenir until his arrival. Rest. The autopsy determined that the mutilations were post mortem. Vincent and Maxine's bodies were discovered by their son, Peter. Ramirez left footprints from a pair of Avia sneakers in the flower beds, which the police photographed and cast. This was virtually the only evidence that the police had at that time. Bullets found at the scene were matched to those found at previous attacks, and the police determined that the serial killer was at large. As his crime spree in 1985 was almost coming to an end, Ramirez attempted to enter the house of a family, but his attempt was thwarted. Ramirez drove away, but his stolen car was clearly seen. Not long after, he broke into the house of another family and shot the husband three times in the head. He then sexually assaulted the wife and left her tied. On his way out, he said to her, tell them that the night stalker was here. The woman was able to give a very precise description of what her assailant looked like and police found fingerprints. They also found that stolen car. They had their man and soon, police released a picture to the public of who the night stalker was, adding that he was a drifter with a very long rap sheet. At the press conference, police said to the cameras, we know who you are, and you cannot hide. And they were right. Ramirez wasn't aware of this, but his face was all over the TV. It said that he only got suspicious when he heard a group of Mexican girls calling him El Matador, the killer. He attempted to carjack a citizen soon after, but was caught by what one might call an angry mob. It said, that they beat him with an inch of his life. He appeared in court in 1989, looking like Satan worshipper, dressed in black, wearing dark sunglasses. During the trial, one of the jurors was actually murdered, and rumors abound that perhaps Ramirez was orchestrated this. Was he really in league with Satan? Ask some people who were perhaps overly devout. There was no way to link him to the murder. It was just a creepy coincidence. On September 20, 1989, Ramirez was handed a down-to-earth verdict. Convicted of 43 charges, this included 1 counts of murder, 5 counts of attempted murder, 11 sexual assault charges, and 14 burglary charges. After hearing this, Ramirez said all he could see in the courtroom were liars, haters, and killers. 
During the penalty phase of the trial, he was sentenced to die in California's gas chamber. He stated to the reporters after the death sentences, Big deal, death always went with the territory. See you in Disneyland! Richard Ramirez died of health complications on June 7, 2013. One of his surviving victims said that was too good for him. He'd been on death row for 23 years, having been married to one of those serial killer loving women. Yes, surprisingly, he had a whole fan base. What do you think about this man? Tell us in the comments.